What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin and Markets. Happy Friday. Hope you guys are all doing well out there. We have more ETF news. We're going to cover several tweets here of that, you know, things are evolving in this ETF story. Every step we take doesn't seem to be any backward steps at all, like two steps forward, one step back or anything like that. It's, you know, five steps forward so far. So it's looking better and better for um, a Bitcoin ETF to get uh, approved in this, this whole batch of ETFs to get approved. And we will talk about what that means for price, uh, what that means for Bitcoin in general. And then what else? I have one more thing to cover. That's kind of like a general knowledge, uh, a general macro or monetary knowledge topic uh, that I did share with Telegram earlier today. Um, and hopefully we can all learn something from that. So I am going out right now on YouTube and Rumble, as well as Telegram. So wherever you guys are at, either YouTube or Rumble, like, comment, subscribe, please. Uh, trying to grow those channels. We've had a couple bigger videos in the last few live streams uh, getting up over. I know it's small, still growing, <laughs> but uh, getting up over 100 views. So that's good. Hopefully I can hit the algorithm and uh, with all of your likes and comments, hopefully that feeds it out to more people. So thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Let's share my screen and we're going to go into first and foremost, let's talk about some of the content that I put out this week. Let me find the right page here. And I'm also going to share my screen over on telegram for you guys. All right, so this is bitcoinandmarkets.com. Put out a proton today, just a few, like an hour ago, CPI prediction, because CPI is coming out next week. Of course, I will be live streaming that CPI drop. Um, those usually happen at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. So I will be live streaming that. And I also went over all my calls for 2023. So this is a Bitcoin and macro show. I've been extremely accurate over the last several years, uh, probably more accurate than any macro analyst I've seen out there. Uh, and I think that boils down to my thesis of what's going on in the economy. So we're at the end of a 75 year credit bubble. They can kick the can by bailouts and doing all that stuff, but they can't print their way out of a debt problem. You know, they can't add debt to get out of a debt problem. And it's just going to continue to grind lower and lower, um, lower growth, lower inflation. It feels like a depression. Emil Kalinowski of Eurodollar University called it the silent depression. I think we have been in a silent depression for a while. Um, and so everything out there where people are, oh, we're going to have runaway inflation. We're going to have runaway um, devaluation of the dollar. They don't understand the underlying nature of what's going on out there. And so th I think that's what's enabled me to be so accurate on most of my calls over the last several years. But anyway, so I, I talked about that on the Proton. Of course, I do a free newsletter that comes out. If you guys want to sign up for the free, just a email list, you can. It comes out every Monday, and then I read through it here on the live stream. Um, all right, and what other content? Uh, I have had, or I did put out um, Market Proton on my Substack. I'm just copying that over. It's the same price to join the Substack as to join the um, website. But also, let me go to bmpro.substack.com and came out with a few posts this week. Um, this morning, mining dashboard. I don't want to open this up because, um, you know, it's paid member content for Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, but there's a dashboard here. It has all the public miners. Uh, all their stock performance, not only their stock performance, but how many Bitcoins did they mine last month? Uh, how many do they have in their treasury? Uh, how many machines do they have? You know, how many actual mining rigs do they have? Um, all sorts of stuff in there for the public miners, which is really cool. And then it has a bunch of mining indicators like their derivative from mining, like the Puel multiplier. Um, what's what's exactly in that it's it comes from the speed of the blocks and and other things so uh, there's mining derivative indicators that's what's on this um this dashboard i also put out the uh 
are the Bitcoin ETFs priced in? Talking about all the confounding variables. That's a very interesting post. You guys can check that out. And also we have a markets dashboard. And this has like correlations. It has all sorts of things like moving averages. Like um, uh, I'll give you a sneak peek of this one. So we have um, on-chain mining derivatives, like fund flows, price indicators macro indicators some more fun flows and correlations and i write a market summary or a takeaway from all this stuff um, so that is the markets dashboard if you guys want to get those every week those are going to be coming out they they used to come out with um uh when dylan and sam were putting them out on a weekly basis but now that it's been like three months i'm getting back into it i'm picking them back up and so those dash dashboards will come out uh once a week markets and once a week for mining as well as one of my posts. Okay. So that's enough of shilling my stuff. Uh, let's get into the new banger. Let's make sure I'm sharing my audio though first. So I'm going to stop sharing and then start sharing again. Where was that? All right. Let's hit it. 20 times Bitcoin, etc. You pointed out the only true use case for it is criminals, drug traffickers, anti money laundering, tax avoidance, criminals, drug traffickers, anti money laundering, tax avoidance, criminals, the largest corporate fine of the time. Another legendary all-time greatest hits in the Bitcoin space, meme and stuff. I mean, this isn't technically Bitcoin. It's from Song a Day, man. And um, uh, it just points out what I was talking about yesterday on the live stream. And I realized when I went back and quality checked the live stream yesterday, one of those videos didn't play. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, one man show trying to get it right. But um, what I'm what I was saying about uh, the jp morgan and and diamond here or diamond is that these guys do worse just as bad or worse than what they claim bitcoin is doing so you know that is a beautiful video it'll go down as one of the greatest okay let's go to some updates here i don't know where which one i want to start off with Let's go to, they can't see you. <laughs> it's only on me. My wife came in here. She's like hiding herself under her hood and stuff. Um, 
Okay, let's go to this one. Bitcoin Magazine tweet just in SEC had a meeting with Fidelity about its spot Bitcoin ETF discussing in-kind creation and redemption. Now, I thought that uh, the Fidelity's ETF was actually Cash Creates. I didn't know that it was in-kind. I thought it was just ARK and BlackRock, but apparently now maybe others are trying to go this way because they have been swayed by the arguments of BlackRock too. Uh, very, very interesting. But let's go to, let's see, that's not the one. Yeah. This one is from um, Abacus, AP Abacus, and I've talked about his stuff here on, uh, previously on the show. It's, he's a good follow. Um, but coming down here, Where was that? Okay, so Fidelity, after their meeting yesterday, they got their ticker from the DTCC, and it is FBTC for Fidelity BTC. And actually, I have another story right here. Fidelity Spot Bitcoin ETF listed on DTCC. So the for people that don't understand or don't know about the DTCC, you don't actually own the stock, you own an IOU from the DTCC. It's kind of it's just a way to speed up settlement uh, when you are doing trading, you know, because if you had to like um, do the transaction, pay for things, then get a stock certificate, there that is very hard to uh, to go fast right to have fast settlement where you can have these major markets that are trading uh trillions of dollars a day and stuff like that so dtcc is a centralized player and of course that is a vulnerability to the system and they obviously take advantage of that so it's not the best solution but um my thoughts on that i i used to think that was you know part of the conspiracy that they control everything, BlackRock, Vanguard, DTCC. There's just a few companies that do that. Um, but, you know, once Bitcoin came around, if you decentralize the money, other things on top that are centralized become less important. And so, um, yeah, it's not the best solution. Hopefully in the future, there's some way to do it in a decentralized manner. Uh, but right now, this DTCC is what enables the trading that we have out there. So anyway, it, this is a big step. If Fidelity is getting their ticker, just like BlackRock got their ticker a little while ago. And it comes on the heels of meeting with the SEC, probably an extended period, right? Where they're they're talking about this in-kind creates and, and all that. Um, so let's go back to this abacus because he brings up a few other good points here in this thread. So this was late last night. He said, update SEC uh, SEC staff is hustling to finalize dotted I's and cross T's to be able to approve spot Bitcoin ETFs uh, as soon as possible. Highly unlikely approvals are delayed beyond January. And he, then he uh, quotes this tweet from Tony PND. Birds are saying, it's funny how the SEC is working double time to approve the ETF by January. After years of slacking, now they're pulling extra time on a holiday month. Karma is a bitch. So that is what they're saying about this. And he has something else to say today about it. So let's scroll up here. SEC starts education messaging via social media of crypto asset securities. So remember, he's calling them crypto asset securities. I mean, I, AP Abacus, probably not a Bitcoin maximalist. That's a stupid term. It's not. It's Bitcoin not crypto. It's a, going to be a Bitcoin security. And the reason why is because the ETF is a security wrapper around the commodity. Okay. That's why it's called, and commodities technically are, I learned from Gary Gensler a few months ago that uh, commodities are commodity securities. So they're all securities. It's just, if one is a plain Jane security, like a stock or a share, you know, or if, if it's a commodity security, but anyway, the, the ETF is a wrapper around the commodity to make it into a security. That's why they call it a Bitcoin security. Note the inclusion of the term securities. This is a nod to the approval of the Bitcoin ETFs from BlackRock, Fidelity, Vanek, etc. 
Gensler's verbal approval pivot seen in the video below. And we're not going to watch that. But here is a the SEC investor ed account. I guess this is an official account, but let's click on this. Uh, and this was out just today. So investments in crypto, no, in Bitcoin. See, like a hashtag crypto, you should do hashtag Bitcoin. That would get this seen more. I mean, the SEC is putting this out and there's only 300 likes. If you put hashtag Bitcoin, it would get 3,000 likes. More people would see it, but you're an idiot and you use the word crypto. Investments in Bitcoin securities can be exceptionally risky and are often volatile. Learn more in our investor alert. And I guess this investor alert was published actually back in March or April, but let me click through. Yeah, this was March 23rd, March 23 of 2023. So it's not new, new, but they're tweeting about it now, re-putting it out there. And this is a trend that people saw. Oh, now I got to share my screen again. This is a trend that people saw. Where is it? right before the futures ETF launched. So in like October of 2017, they started doing this educational push. Uh, and then December, they approved it. So they're starting this educational push. There's also a lot of marketing push. We've seen uh, things coming out in the mainstream press. Bloomberg had a very positive piece about Bitcoin this morning. I can't remember the headline up right off the top of my head, but I remember thinking, oh, this is a uh, part of the marketing that's going. Uh, Coinbase has launched some marketing. There's a few other really high quality videos that have come out, uh, like, you know, longer form commercials, like a minute long commercials. So the, the marketing and the education is getting pushed up. And like I said at the beginning, there's no two steps forward, one step back. It's five steps forward at this point. Everything is going down the line towards approval, um, which is amazing. All right. Next one up is going to be from... James Seifert. He is Bloomberg Intelligence with Eric Bokunas. And he says, Van Eck has submitted an S1 amendment to their Bitcoin ETF. They've been trying to launch this thing for so many years that it's amendment number five. Okay. And what he wanted to point out was their ticker symbol. So like Fidelity, I said, was FBTC. The iShares one or BlackRock is iBTC and Van Eck is going full Bitcoin here and using the HODL ticker H-O-D-L. And for those people new to Bitcoin, that does not stand for hold on for dear life. It was a drunken misspelling of the word hold. So it, it just means hold uh, when you have a HODL stack, that's your hoard. If you're holding, you're just hoarding. Uh, that's what we in Bitcoin use the term HODL for. So that is very interesting. Now, he, uh, James Seifert goes on. He says, create redeem language includes both in-kind and cash creates still. Looking more and more like everyone will leave that optionality in their S1s, but their 19B-4 approvals may only allow cash creates, at least to start. Still waiting on some potential 19B-4 updates to confirm this, though. So very interesting. Uh, th these guys are good follows because they keep you up to date on everything that's going on. But uh, yeah, so after all these meetings with SEC, these guys are just moving forward. They're getting their ticker symbols. You know, they're, they're pumping it. They're marketing it. Everyone's moving forward as if it's approved. Now, for people that might be new to the channel, um, my theory here is that BlackRock is part of Wall Street. And we have a battle going on, a war going on in the world that is part of the fourth turning, I think. And th that is the globalist Marxists that are represented by Davos, you know, Klaus Schwab, all the heads, uh, most of the heads of state in the Western world, uh, the heads of universities, you know, all the woke stuff, all the climate alarmism, all of that stuff, including the U.S., administration, current administration right now, all those people are part of the Marxist globalists or global Marxists, whatever. 
uh, that is their ideology is Marxism. It's cultural Marxism. And they are at war with Wall Street. And I think this got kicked off during COVID. Prior to COVID, Wall Street, which is the capitalists, and they're very, very powerful. They're also crony capitalists, but they're capitalists uh, versus Marxists. And they were willing to go along with these globalists. They thought, okay, we'll play along. We still really have the money and the power, but we will go along with these guys. But then when the mask came off during COVID, and these guys came out of the woodwork, and you guys I know have felt it in the last years, that it seems like they're going full tilt at this. The the globalist woke people and so the mask came off and the wall and wall street said "Uh, uh-uh, no way we're capitalists you you're going to take us down a peg we're not going to follow you so who is who is owned by wall street the federal reserve so we have this blackrock has pivoted uh, all these you know big time money has pivoted t- towards bitcoin the Fed has been stiff arming CBDCs while the globalists at the UN and the globalists in Davos and the globalists at the ECB and the EU and Washington, D.C., the, those globalists are pushing for a CBDC where the Fed is pushing against it. And Wall Street, who is also the Fed, is part of Wall Street, they're pushing for Bitcoin now. So Bitcoin is being pushed by the capitalists against the Marxists that want a CBDC. That, I think, is this big battle going on right now, or at least part, very big part of the battle going on. And so, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. Now, guess guess who the SEC works for? Guess who Gary Gensler works for? He works for the administration, the global Marxists. So his head is that point that's being smashed between Wall Street and the globalists the man is gary gensler right there in the middle so all that being said we can now look at this progress that we're making forward steps step you know there are no steps backwards blackrock fidelity i guess vanguard's not part of this but um everybody a lot of money and interests are stepping forward they're just marching forward and daring the SEC daring the administration to deny this. That's the game that we're in right now. So there is a possibility that Gary Gensler is forced to deny them. Even if everything in court, you know, every court case is going for Bitcoin and towards this being approved, Everything is going in Bitcoin's way. But Gary Gensler might be forced to deny them by, you know, his power brokers that he has. So uh, that that's how I want to look at this um, as we go over the next few weeks uh, and going into that. OK. Before we get into this tweet by Jeff Ross, I want to take a look at the price real quick. So that because it was starting to pump right before I got on, right before I hit go. And there we go, guys. We are going to we are at new highs. Is that new high? Yes. This is a new high. 44,522 right now. Let me just. Yeah, barely a new high. But we're pushing, we're pushing higher right now. So that is very interesting. I noticed earlier today. There was some weakness around this level, and I was like, oh, man, it, there is some possible weakness here. It doesn't, I'm not getting a good vibe from this. I thought we were going to reject off this area and possibly, you know, um, go down, go back down here. Not That wouldn't be catastrophic. That wouldn't mean the, the bull market is over. That wouldn't mean anything bad at all. All it would mean is that it's going to take a little bit more time to work our way through this, maybe reset some of the variables or some of the oscillators and the indicators and things, but that also would put in, that would lock in some bearish divergence, which would be another bad thing. So let me 
bring this up and squeeze this down. So we have this uh, bearish divergence that has built this whole time that we've been going up here. Uh, that wouldn't be good if we went down and we locked in this bearish divergence. It, that Again, that wouldn't be the end of the story either. We could still continue to pump, but uh, it's interesting now that we are going up right now. Okay. Now, before I sign off for the day, let's go to the last tweet. And this is here by Jeff Ross. And like I like the guy. I think he's a high-quality Bitcoiner. Very, very smart guy, obviously. Um, and But I disagree with the even the premise of this tweet. So we're going to go through it, and hopefully um, there's something to be learned here. So, so this is say uh, he says this is what I'm watching the current run rate of the overnight reverse repo agreement. So if you guys don't know, if you're listening to this, you probably do know. But the uh, overnight reverse repo is not as a whole as a thing is not limited just to the Fed. The worldwide repo market does these same things, but the Fed has their uh, overnight repo operations, and that's what he's talking about here. And they, over the last couple of years, it built up to over two trillion and two trillion dollars. That means the the banks or entities they bring cash to the Fed, and the Fed will swap that for treasuries. And then you just hold the treasuries and the banks and the people that that lend the cash they get paid a percent a reverse repo percent and that is usually five basis points above the lower bound of the fed funds range so if it's at 5.25 right now that's the lower bound so the reverse repo rate is 5.3 so that's what they're getting paid um however they're coming to this with extra cash this is extra cash that they had on deposit or extra cash somewhere. And they're also limited. I think they're the each party is limited to like 80 or 90 billion. Or I, I don't know. I don't know exactly, but there, there's some limits. So these are only the big guys, the very big guys, primary dealers, systemically important banks, okay, that are doing this. So um, he says that they're withdrawing this at 200 billion per month at today's level of 826 billion this run rate would leave the r it's rrp i don't know uh he's saying orr facility empty in approximately four months that is april 2024 i agree with this i think that's going to happen what i disagree is what it means the reverse repo is the is best thought of as excess liquidity Ooh. not really i don't i don't agree with that because they are uh they want treasuries there's demand for treasuries these treasuries can be used in you know reused repledged there is demand for treasuries above and beyond the coupon so whatever the reverse repo rate is if it's 5.3 or as you know we are coming up maybe say it was 2.3 whatever um there is demand for treasuries above and beyond the coupon because they can use them. They have a utility value. So it's not solely to soak up excess liquidity. It's also to meet a market demand as well. All right. Uh, which is, which has been recently enticed to absorb much of the heavy U S uh, the treasury bill issuance by the U S treasury. No, <laughs> no, the enticed to absorb much of the tr heavy treasury issuance. There is demand out there for treasuries at any level, at any level, guys. See, if you want to keep the 10 year at a, you know, like yield curve control, you want to keep the 10 year below 2% then yes, there would be excess to uh, be absorbed because you're keeping that that price capped or whatever. You know, you have the yield is capped. But if there's no cap, if they're not trying to hold the yield at a certain percentage, if there was 
excess treasury issuance that could not be absorbed by the market, the yields would go up. And what do we see for yields? Yields are down to 4.1% 4, 4 on the 10-year. Yields are down to 4.1%. And the Treasury or the um, Fed Fund's future range is 5.25 to 5.5. If there was all this excess Treasury issuance that couldn't be absorbed by the market and had to be absorbed, the only way it could be absorbed was through reverse repo, then yields would be much higher. They would be over the Fed funds range. And also, <laughs> the reverse repo, when they took cash and they got the treasuries, those treasuries didn't come from the open market. They came from the Fed's balance sheet. It's not like the Fed went out and bought the treasuries and then gave it an overnight repo. They already own the treasuries. They have a big balance sheet. Seven trillion dollars worth. They just took those and lent them out. So this did not soak up any, this is not soaking up any excess liquidity or any heavy treasury bill issuance. So once this facility is tapped dry, then the private markets will be tasked with absorbing future treasury issuance. The market already absorbs all the treasuries, guys. They already absorb it at 4.1%. If the, if the, you know, that for the 10 year, if the 10 year was 5%, it would absorb everything at 5%. If it was at 3%, it would absorb everything at 3%. But the rates aren't going up. The rates are going down right now from 5% down to 4.1%. Does that sound like they're looking at this and saying, oh my gosh, there's excess liquidity that's not going into repo anymore and blah, 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 blah. No, that's the exact opposite of what this would mean. So um, the reason, and I can't remember where I read this, but I just read this like last week, uh, explanation on What's going on? Why? I don't know if it was Deer Point, was Deer Point, uh, Pinecone Macro or whatever, or Deer Point on Twitter. Now I can't remember, but they were talking about the reason for this. And this is because the clients of these big banks that are going to reverse repo, they are requesting the money. They're wanting to get loans. And then they go out into the money markets and buy, uh, you know, three month treasury bills. So that that's the demand. The reason why the reverse repo is draining is because the banks have to use that money elsewhere. When this goes down to zero, when it's tapped dry, they are going to have to go into their balance sheet to lend. So there's other uses that, that that is pulling this money out of reverse repo. And it's not because demand is going down. It's because demand is going up. We can see that in the, the yields. They're crashing. Demand for treasuries is going up. There was, there was heavy treasury bill issuance, but there's unlimited demand for treasuries, especially in bad times. So... This is showing that there is more demand for treasuries, not less. Um, then he says this should prove to be insufficient. The Federal Reserve will need to step in as a treasury buyer of last resort. No, they will. What will happen here is these banks will catch contagion because they their balance sheets will start deteriorating rapidly once this is tapped dry. And then no one's going to want to lend to them. And they're not going to want to lend anything to anybody else because everyone is tap dry. Everyone is uh, getting this contagion and we have a financial crisis. And then what the Fed does is they come in and are, well, they're lender, but they're also buyer, whatever, of last resort because of the contagion. Not because of a lack of demand, but because people want, you know, there is a minimum amount of liquidity and 
throughput through the plumbing that needs to happen on a daily basis. People need to lend uh, and people need to lend treasuries and people need collateral to do all this financial plumbing. There's a minimum amount. But what if that minimum amount of flow cannot be met because no one is lending? Then the Fed comes in and it's not because there's no demand, but it's because there's no supply. But anyway, uh, I think I might have muddied the water there at the very end, but I think um, maybe we got something out of that. All right. So that's going to do it for today, guys. Let me just go back to BitcoinAndMarkets.com. Check it out. Support my content. If you're watching on Rumble or YouTube, like, comment, subscribe. Let me check the comments, see if there's any comments for today. All right. We got Happy Friday. Yes, happy Friday, guys. It's Friday's always a big day in my house. And I'm actually, it's a date night tonight. So we're actually going out to dinner with the wife here. And the kids are, I don't know, they're going to eat pizza or something. <laughs> uh, my kids are separated at ages. So the oldest can babysit. That's pretty great. Okay, AJ, I like this take, but what about Jamie Dimon? He seems to be on the side of the globalists. That's a good point, AJ. Uh, Jamie Dimon is, yeah, I think he is. But, you know, we don't know his, what his heart and soul is. <laughs> um, but, yes, he seems to be on the side of the globalists. He's kind of an old school, I would say. Um I can't remember his stances. I'm trying to think of his stances around COVID and stuff, but that's that's a one-off. If you remember that video that we took a look at yesterday uh, on the live stream, the Bank of America CEO, he was looking disgusted at what Jamie Dimon was saying. So yeah, he's a one-off. He's a little bit different, but BlackRock, all the clients of BlackRock, the big money on Wall Street, they are against this woke and maybe not everybody personally right but as a rule they are shipped they have shifted away from acceptance of it towards fighting it that's what i think okay um every time the bank fails jamie diamond gets his wings <laughs> yes yes all right um let's check telegram and see if you guys have posted anything if you guys have comments make sure you put them in there let's see aj back here okay he says when youtube starts that you switch to that um yeah that's cool make sure you like comment subscribe <laughs> all right guys that's gonna do it for today thanks for joining me have a great weekend and i'll see you on the next one bye